sometimes people have a perception of like in an ayahuasca ceremony you're just like throwing up in a bucket for like mm-hmm. six hours and yeah that's not what it's like at all uh-huh. um it can certainly be an intense experience and, and every ceremony is different yeah and every person's experience is different in a ceremony it's a profoundly healing wise intelligent medicine and I think it's very important for people to kind of sense where they feel called if they feel called and like I said to trust these medicines find us we don't have to go looking for them if we are truly ready they will show up in kind of miraculous ways sometimes hello my friends welcome to it's all magic I am your guide your host and your friend Devin Hine And here, we'll be discussing how to make your life truly feel like magic. I believe that our very existence on Earth is nothing less than a miracle, and that we all have so much potential to learn, to grow, to experience, and to create during our short time here. It is both my passion and my pleasure to walk this path of life optimization by your side, where we'll discuss topics like passion, purpose, intuition, manifestation, physical well-being, and much, much more. I'm a yoga teacher, a meditation and breathwork facilitator, and a national board certified health and wellness coach. But more importantly, I am an eternal optimist, a lover of life, and a forever student. It is my hope that with each and every episode, you too will finally start to believe it really is all magic after all. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another magical episode of It's All Magic. If you tuned in last week, then you will know that today's episode is part two of a conversation I had with Samira Gassamian, who is a masterful storyteller and healer woman in every sense of the word. Last week, we touched on her own personal healing journey, her spiritual path, what it was like losing her father unexpectedly, how that actually helped her in some ways to ascend and step deeper into herself. And in this week's episode, we go even deeper. We start talking about the journey of the soul and past life regressions because she is a facilitator of past life regressions. We then talk about the plant medicine practiced within the Shipibo shamanic lineage of which Samira is an apprentice. So we talk all about ayahuasca and combo and bufo and jape and so many other medicines. It might blow your mind. So I'll say on that note, whether you have heard of these topics and you are completely open to them, or this is the first time you're hearing about them and you're a little bit scared to go there, just stay with me. You are in a safe place here. We are exploring every facet of the human experience together on this podcast. So know that it's okay to leave your judgment at the door and just go on this ride with me. You're going to be okay. I promise you. It's fascinating stuff and you never know when something might just inspire you or feel really aligned for your journey as well. So before we dive into today's conversation, I of course want to allow us to do a couple deep breaths together. Today, let's go with the humming breath, bee's breath. If you have listened to the podcast for a while, you'll know this is one of my favorites. I personally feel instantly calmed when I do this breath work, so I love sharing it with others. It's also incredibly simple, so you can do it at any point in the day. The way it works is that you're going to inhale through the nose and then you're going to seal your lips and hum out of your mouth as you exhale. So it'll look and sound something like this. And you exhale until you are fully out of air. So try to make that exhale as long as you possibly can. Today, we are going to do five rounds and then we will dive into the fascinating conversation. If you would like to close your eyes, you can do so now. And let's just go ahead and get started with that inhale. So go ahead and empty out from your previous breath. And then inhale through your nose, filling up all the way. 
Seal your lips and hum it out. Mm. Round two, inhale through the nose. Seal your lips and hum. Mm. And again, inhale through the nose. Close your lips and hum it out. Mm. Second to last round, inhale through the nose. And hum. Mm. Last round. Inhale through the nose. Longest hum yet. Mm. Inhale through the nose normally. And out of the nose. Hmm. Beautiful. You can flutter open your eyelids if you got the chance to close them. Ah, okay. I'm feeling refreshed and ready to dive into it. Without further ado, let's get on into the conversation. I will see you on the other side, my friends. So can you kind of walk us through your personal belief of kind of the journey of the soul? Like how does this how does this thing work? Are we Mm. little orbs of light up there somewhere? And then we decide I'm ready to go down again. Like what, what is the, the situation? Yeah. And, and I mean, first I'll say, this is like the quote that I kind of live by. I know enough to know that I don't know anything, you (laughs) know? So I'm not sitting here as like, I'm the expert on the soul's journey. Like, no, I, I know what I've come into understanding for my own spiritual path and my own journey. I think a lot of it has come through, through my experience of my dad's death. Um, and through as well, what I've studied, um, with past life regression, specifically the work of Brian Weiss, Mm -hmm. um, from what I understand, I don't know if we're balls of light. I don't know what we are. I know that we're consciousness. Yes. I know that our consciousness still exists. And I think to an extent, the consciousness still exists as like the lifetime that we just exited. Mm. But I think it expands beyond that. Mm -hmm. So while we're here, you know, yes, some of us tap into other aspects of who we've been but many of us don't ever go beyond that many of us just identify as like I'm Samira or I'm Devin and that's it but I think that that essence that like energy signature of who we were remains and expands to kind of include the totality of the soul Um, I know that after or I believe that after we transition out of a physical lifetime Mm -hmm. we go through a spiritual process on the other side of kind of like uh renewal and purification and healing and so we experience something that's known as a life review where we review all of the different experiences that we've had and we actually have the opportunity to see the whole picture you know while we're in it we only know our side But we have the opportunity to see it really as like a true neutral observer Mm -hmm. in spirit form. And so we see the ways that we've impacted other people. And we go through that review. Based on that, I think we take some time to just kind of process and heal. And I'm sure that we have guides and, you know, spiritual beings who assist us in that on the other side. And then... There comes a point where the soul gets to decide then, okay, what's next? And some souls, I I believe, don't decide to come back to Earth. Some mm-hmm. souls decide to, you know, exist in other dimensions, other realms, um, or to ascend into, you know, these higher spiritual beings. Yeah. Um, but many of us choose to come back. And I think in that process, we take into account what what we learned and gleaned from our last go around. Mm -hmm. And we decide for ourselves what lessons we want to focus on 
the themes that we want to see in our lives, how we want to learn those lessons. Mm -hmm. And so we connect with other souls in our soul family or soul group um, and make soul contracts or agreements of, you know, you're going to come in at this time to help me with this thing. Or like if I'm going off track, if I'm losing my way and I'm not in alignment or I'm losing sight of my purpose, you're going to come along to be the mirror that then reminds me who the fuck I am Mm -hmm. and helps me get back on that path. And so we make all of these different types of agreements. And a lot of these agreements, like they're signing up to play like hard roles. Wow. You know, they're not always, it's not just because, oh, well, this person's my soulmate or they're my soul family. So surely this is going to be like a beautiful, loving relationship. No, because a lot of times we learn through the really hard, (laughs) difficult ones, you know? And so some of these souls that we've been incarnating with forever and have such deep, deep, beautiful, true spiritual love with are going to be the ones who show up and treat us like shit or like don't understand us or, you know, don't see us or whatever it might be. Because that's the lesson that we want to learn and that's the way that we've agreed to learn it with them. Yeah. Um, I, I strongly believe that we choose our parents Mm -hmm. strongly believe that me too. Um, that was something that I felt even before going through this, um, process, uh, with my dad transitioning out. Um, but believe it even more strongly since Mm then. Um, and yeah, it's like, ultimately, I think if I had to describe it in one word, it's choice. Yeah. We choose so much. And it's not to say that everything is predetermined. I think that life is a combination of what's kind of predetermined and destined or fate, as some people call it, and also free will because we do have free will. Mm-hmm. And that's for better and for worse. We have the free will to choose the most amazing, incredible lives for ourselves. And we also have the free will to choose like the shittest existence we could possibly imagine. Yeah. Where we're just completely disconnected from who we really are and our purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, we we come back to Earth and maybe remember some parts of it but to an extent kind of forget yeah actually this is a little bit of a side note but there was this indigenous culture and I'm blanking on um you know which tribe it was but I remember hearing that there was an indigenous culture that celebrates death and mourns birth Because they see the celebration of death to them, like we celebrate birthdays and we mourn death. But to them, they're like, well, in death, your spirit is returning home. You're returning to absolute bliss. Yes. But in in birth, you're getting taken away from that. You're coming to this earth school where you're going to forget that you're of source, that you are like a fractal element of God. You're going to forget all of that and you're going to deal with hardship and pain and suffering and so I thought that's just like so interesting not to say that I think we should mourn birth but it's such an interesting way of looking at it because it's so in opposition to how we in western society relate to birth and death absolutely it also reminds me of something else you had on your Instagram from Mm. a while ago that I loved I want to say it was like the 12 truths of life or of being a soul or something Mm. and it kind of had the the journey where it said like you will choose a character you will choose a name you will choose parents you will choose a family an environment um kind of a life path you will forget all of this and you can remember anytime you want yes and that almost makes me cry me too so profound yeah yeah and it's so (sighs) real and I I think that's that's what the journey really is and that's that's what healing is that's what being on a spiritual path is it's remembering yes all of it is remembering like this this all exists this is all still available to us we just have to remember absolutely and one last thing on that note is something else that you've talked about on your instagram so beautifully is that we've played every role We've been the villain and the victim. We've been the good guy, the bad guy. I know some of my own past lives. I've been female. I've been male. I've been Asian. I've been Greek. I've been European. Mm -hmm. And so 
it's beautiful to remember that I think part of the reason that we're doing this whole reincarnation business is to be every spoke of the wheel, to have every possible experience so that we can truly internalize empathy and know what that man on the street is feeling because I've been him before too. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for bringing that up because yeah, I think it's so important. And I, you know, I think realistically speaking, there's probably not many people who are going into a past life regression expecting or even being open to seeing a lifetime where they harmed people. Yeah. But those lifetimes have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I have I have some friends, not not clients of mine, but friends, uh, one in particular that's coming up um, and and a client of mine as well, actually, that I can think of now um, who did have like past life regression experiences where they did see lifetimes where they weren't on the best paths and mm. they maybe did some shady things or, I, you know, the friend I'm thinking about um, saw a lifetime where he was a really abusive person mm. and he in this lifetime experienced a lot of abuse. So I think that was such an interesting thing for, you know, somebody who in some ways was like victimized in this lifetime to see themselves as the perpetrator Yeah, in another lifetime. Yeah. Um, and I think that, the more that we can be open to that, at least be open to the possibility that mm-hmm. we've been the bad guy sometimes too. Yeah. Um, I think the more that we can have empathy and compassion for the people who are playing that role right now. Yeah. And this even zooms in closer, like beyond, you know, the past life experiences. We've all been the villain in someone's story in this life too. Right. And that doesn't mean that we were acting in harmful ways, but I guarantee you someone along the way has seen you as the villain. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have people in my life who just like think I'm like Mother Teresa. And then I have people who are like, you're a bully. You're oh. this, you're that. Yeah, I've I've dealt with every kind of projection under yeah. the sun. And I think at the end of the day, I'm like, I, two things. One, I I'm self-aware enough to, and I'm open and honest with myself enough to consider the possibility of anything somebody throws to me. So somebody comes at me telling me I'm an awful person, I'm mean, I've bullied them, I'm this, I'm that. I'm not just going to immediately dismiss that. I'm actually going to sit with it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit with it and I'm going to try it on and I'm going to ask myself the real honest question of have I been a bully? Have I acted as a bully? Mm -hmm. Have I perhaps had subconsciously not great intentions? Have I acted in a way that you know consciously or unconsciously was intending to cause this person harm I'll sit with that and I'll like really really try it on Mm -hmm. um and I know myself really well I know who I am I know what my intentions are I know that I'm willing to ask myself those really fucking hard questions which I don't think many people are yeah so when I come back and say not to that person, but to myself, like, no, I don't, I don't consider those things to be true of me. I get that that was your experience. That's how you perceive it. I'm not Mm going to take that away from you. If that's how you need to see this right now, if you need me to be the villain in your story, okay, that's fine. But I know, I know who I am and I know when somebody is projecting, uh, you know, a persona, a role onto me, Yeah. And so kind of being okay with that. All right. If you, if you need me to be the villain in your story, I'll be the villain in your story Mm -hmm. because I know that that doesn't actually mean anything about me. Yeah. I know, I know myself. I really know myself well. So we have to, we have to know ourselves, but I think in order to know ourselves, we have to be willing to look at those parts. We have to be willing to look at the times when like, like, I know myself now and I I know my intentions now and I know that I have not always acted in positive ways. Yeah. I know why I didn't act in those ways also. Mm -hmm. You know, I I know it all and I'm sure that there's still plenty to discover and I'm happy and open to continuing to, to discover that. But I think like we have to we have to accept all of it. We can't just love the parts of ourselves that are easy to love. Yes. 
there's there's other parts too and those parts need love the most absolutely you know yeah so one question to kind of round out this topic yeah there's one other topic i want to dive in with yeah. you if someone could potentially regress back to these lifetimes where they mm-hmm. were the abuser or lifetimes where they were traumatized why would someone do these past life regressions? Essentially, mm-hmm. what is the healing nature of doing these past life regressions? What is the point of doing this at all? Yeah. So this is like, it's it's a big topic. Yeah. And I, I think the simplest way that I can explain it in my current awareness, and I'm... I'm fairly, I would say, young in my journey as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. Um, In my awareness, and this is bringing in some of the nervous system as well. So when things are still running active in the subconscious or within the nervous system, there is not a recognition of time. They kind of exist in a timeless space. And so when we are triggered by something uh, that activates within our nervous system a traumatic memory, whether that's from this lifetime or from another lifetime. There is no, there's no switch in the nervous system that's like, oh, but that already happened. It's not happening now. The nervous system registers that trigger as if the original traumatic event is happening in that moment. Mm. So... That's why we often have disproportionate reactions to things. Like logically, you might know that you're safe. Logically, you know all of these things about the current circumstances. But within your nervous system, there is like just a crazy, uh, you know, process happening, unfolding. Yeah. Um, and it's because when we have those memories there that's what's being dredged up so when we bring these past life memories into our conscious awareness it gives the the subconscious conscious mind and the nervous system a little bit of a chance to kind of recognize a bit of linear Mm. time of like this already happened and this isn't happening anymore yeah and it's, it's sort of the same realm as like working with shadow aspects. So shadow aspects also exist beneath our conscious awareness. So you could consider past life memories to be an aspect of the shadow, which is essentially just everything that exists beneath our conscious awareness. Mm. And sometimes shadow aspects act up a lot too until you bring conscious awareness to them until you bring them into the light of consciousness out of the shadow and really look at it and see it and love it and accept it you yeah. know then these things begin to heal and how we relate to them shifts and how our nervous system relates to them shifts as well okay that was also beautifully said mm. so i want to kind of shift this into one other modality that yeah. i know you're very passionate about which is of course plant medicine yeah and i know that you studied in peru um i think shipibo shamanism if yeah I'm correct. yeah so Let's start kind of at the beginning of what is shamanism for people Mm. listening that are like, what are they talking about? What is this plant medicine? What is shamanism? Yeah. And how, why were you called to that? Yeah. It's so funny. I'm like, wow, how do I even define shamanism? Right? I've never really (laughs) thought about that. Um, So, okay. I'm going to attempt a definition at at shamanic medicine, which might be like very limited. Um, But I feel like shamanic medicine is medicine that kind of transcends the physical realm. Mm. I think it's a lot of blending the spiritual realm and the physical realm and learning how to walk between them and to facilitate healing in a way that that transcends just the physical and works deeper within the soul in an energetic way. Mm. Um, and, and the other question was, and how did I get drawn? Yeah. Why were you called mm, to that? So I really, as far back as I can remember, I think I've had like a deep fascination and, and draw toward shamanic medicine, Mm -hmm. especially earlier on in my spiritual journey. Um, I felt really, really drawn to indigenous medicine and indigenous shamanism And I remember like, you know, there's a part of me that was like, wow, like I wish this was my life, but I don't think this is like something that's available for me because I'm not, you know, of a lineage that Mm. practices this. 
Um, and I, I also began to feel a very deep call to work with ayahuasca. That was something that kept showing up on my path. And I, I knew was going to eventually be something that found me. But I, my process with ayahuasca was very much like I, I trust that the medicine will present itself when it's time for me yeah. to work with her. But I'm not going to go seeking this out. I think it's something that I need to let find me. And so I probably knew for about three years before I first sat with ayahuasca that I was going to work with ayahuasca. Yeah. And yeah, I had I had a big um, a big medicine experience with Bufo, which kind of opened up that path for me. And if for you or anyone who's not familiar with Bufo, Bufo is a, a toad venom. OK. It comes from the Sonoran Desert toad found in Mexico and I think some parts of the U.S. as well. Um, and so, yeah, I had this this really profound healing experience with Bufo, and it was definitely at that point the deepest healing by far that I'd ever experienced. I had yeah. so much trauma that I released from my body and um, unblocked my throat. Like I was screaming. There was just so many amazing, amazing releases that I had when I worked with that medicine. And that kind of, um, yeah, that was like my initiation into wow. the medicine path. <laughs> and I've, it's Probably so not gentle. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. But the thing is, I, I hadn't planned it. Like that was very much a, a medicine that just showed up for me. Um, and I think, again, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. Um, I was really ready for it. I'd hit a plateau with um, therapy where I was like, okay, like I've done all of this and this actually kind of ties back to something I was talking about much earlier but um, I had done so much work with like my conscious mind but I had not tapped into my body at all okay I was so I was so disconnected from my body that even I have I was working with a somatic therapist but like I was so blocked off from my body that like we never were even able to kind of like go into the somatic realm together um and this medicine was just like, I think really what I needed for like the degree of disconnection and trauma that I was dealing with was just something to absolutely like blast me out of my body so that my body could do what it needed to do. Yeah. Um, and so that was what happened. And then from that point, I was like, OK, so this is this is the medicine period. This is the period where I'm going really, really deep and I'm clearing as much of this shit as I can out of my body yeah. um, and I'm and I'm healing. And so um, ayahuasca did um, finally show up on my path in mm -hmm. a way that was just like this feels like a full body. Yes. Wow. And so I went to Costa Rica and I went to a retreat for the first time. Um, and I sat with ayahuasca and, and combo at the retreat as well. That's also where I, I received rape for the first time. Hape wow. as it's known, um, often here in the States. Um, and I was just so completely enamored and entranced by the medicine, by the shamans, by this way of life. And I remember that the shamans like you know telling us about their center in Peru and saying to everyone you know we hope to see you there and making this kind of like you know one of those one of those like loose plans that you know is probably never going to follow through yes. um, with the friend that I was at that retreat with of like let's go let's go to Peru to their center in July of you know whatever year and that was actually when I ended up going, which is so wild wow. because I was I was so like I that was like me coming onto my path. And <sighs> when you're when you're on your path, like things happen quickly. And yeah. so it was like, yeah, I said that I was going to go then and I went then um, and I I stayed very close with them. They're now my teachers and they are just the most wonderful, amazing powerful human beings you could possibly imagine and wow. I love them so much and they crack me up because if you were ever to see them in just like day-to-day -day life they just seem so normal uh -huh. and then in ceremony they're like the most bad ass people you could oh possibly imagine they're so powerful and it's a father and daughter 
I love that. Yeah, it felt that that first retreat was um, right around the two year anniversary of my dad's death. It actually fell like on one of the ceremonies. And so that felt really special to me that I was sitting with a father and daughter Mm -hmm. um, leading the ceremony. And yeah, it's like I really feel, you know, I had I had a moment, I think, after I went to Peru where I remembered that there was like a a period of time where I kept seeing this vision of what I wanted my life to be like. And it was like living in the jungle and, you know, working with shamans and experiencing plant medicine and all of these things. And um, I thought, but I, like I said, I didn't think that that was something that was ever accessible or available to me. Yeah. It was just kind of this, this like far fetched, far fetched dream of like, what if my life could be like this? But mm-hmm. no, it can't. Um, and then I was in Peru and I was like, wait, <laughs> I'm doing the thing. Yes. I'm, I'm doing the thing that I saw. I'm literally here in the Amazon That's jungle. Amazing. Like I'm here for five weeks and I'm doing this crazy deep dive and I'm learning so much and it's just it's just so powerful and the thing is I'm not really on this path with any agenda Mm. like there's no there's no end goal that I Mm. have in mind for myself people ask me sometimes well are you studying with them because you want to serve ayahuasca one day and I'm like no I'm just this is where this is where spirit and life has led me yeah um and and truth be told I don't think it's for me to decide right I think that if that is what the medicine wants Mm -hmm. then she will show me but until then I'm I'm really just here like listening to spirit and trusting and you know, I'm, I'm constantly so humbled and so grateful that I get to have this experience and that I get to receive this, this beautiful indigenous wisdom because there are, there are many, many tribes who don't share Mm. with the outside world. And I totally understand why. Right. Um, but I think, um, my teachers, especially, and, and many others in the Shipibo culture and many other tribes as well are, are just so unbelievably generous in sharing their wisdom with people from other cultures and with the world as a whole. And I think a lot of that is because the plants, and this is what I've been told by my shamans um, and other healers as well, is like the plants want to be shared. Mm. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you had to travel deep into the jungle to experience ayahuasca. And there's pros and cons to this. Yeah. Ayahuasca being more accessible now. There's yeah. a lot of cons. Yeah. Um, but I to, to focus on kind of the positive side and what I've I've been told by these shamans is that the plants, the medicine, they want to be shared now. And so they're they're sharing themselves with humanity in a greater way yeah. because it's time. They have a role as well in yeah. the healing and evolution of humanity. And I'm just like incredibly grateful that somehow I've ended up on this path and I, I have no idea where it's going to take me yeah. um, or what that entails other than I, I know I'll be going back to Peru in November and that's as far as I've gotten. <laughs> that's amazing. So you've also mentioned some of the plant medicine specifically that you've worked with. So mm-hmm. we've mentioned ayahuasca, combo, bufo, hape. Yeah. Can you kind of walk through each one and just say what is it and what are the effects and what ways is it healing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So bufo, as I mentioned, is a toad medicine. And um, it's it's like received through smoking it. So okay. you you inhale it from um, a pipe. And Bufo, if I had to describe it in like two words, blast off. Like wow. Bufo is an instant blast off type of medicine, whereas many other medicines are more of like a slow, lengthy journey. Mm-hmm. This is like a big, somewhat quick blast off. Um, and the things that people like the common experiences people have with bufo are a sense of oneness like a profound Mm. sense of oneness a dissolution of the ego a connection with everything 
And that's absolutely something that I experienced as well. Yeah. But like I said, for me, it was a lot of somatic release, um, which I don't think is necessarily common. I don't think it's like a hallmark of the medicine, but I just think that that medicine gifted me that because yeah. it was what I needed. Um, so, and yeah, it, it, it produces, I think you can come out of the experience, especially if you integrate properly which is like the most important um, aspect of really any plant medicine work is the integration but I think that it can instill a much deeper sense of connection and unity consciousness and and love and compassion for others and for the self as well I think the more that we connect with others like it it flows inward and outward of course so that's bufo in a very small nutshell yeah um combo is a frog medicine so somewhat similar animal but very very different okay. medicinal experience okay um so combo is uh the venom of an amazonian tree frog okay and it's administered through burns on the skin so i don't know if i can show you yeah you can see like little bits here wow yes Th- this this arm is actually like covered pretty much because i've been doing some self applications for myself wow um but yeah so the skin is burned um and it's it's just a very light superficial burn uh-huh. and then you kind of rub the skin to expose the the layer beneath uh-huh. and the venom is applied in like dots like these little balls of venom that get applied to the spots which are called gates okay and combo is a strongly purgative medicine so it's mm. heavy on the purging okay um you're instructed to drink like two liters of water and and quick like you chug two liters of water so the water is really sitting in your stomach as opposed to dispersing in the system yeah and then um, as as the medicine is applied, like typically you'll start to feel the heart begin to race and the head maybe starts to tingle. The face might tingle and start to swell sometimes. Um, and then vomiting will begin. And what combo is doing is just sweeping the body of toxins, mm. of energetic toxins. It's a deeply, deeply cleansing medicine and I've I can't say enough good things about combo I love combo so much I feel it has helped me I mean in the last like six months I swear the only reason that I haven't gotten sick is because combo I've been working with combo microdosing combo to boost my immune system that's amazing. So combo is sometimes called like the vaccine of the forest. Um, many indigenous tribes use this to just clean out the system of anything that might be there. Wow. It, um, it's cool hearing that because at first someone listening to you, you're like, OK, your face is going to swell. You're going to throw up. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, <laughs> I know. And some people some people are like, I really want to try combo. But like, I hate throwing up. And I'm yeah. like, oh, I mean. I, I kind of get that, but yeah. I, I think I work with a lot of medicines that are purgative. And yeah. I personally think like they, it feels so good to get that stuff out of the body. Yeah. Like, I'm, am I saying I love throwing up? No, I mean, it's not pleasant. Right. Um, and, and combo especially, I think it's not a particularly pleasant experience. I'm not mm-hmm. going to sugarcoat that. It's quite intense. Yeah. Um, you might feel a little bit like you're dying. Wow. But for it to be that and for me to be like I love this medicine so much like I think that says a lot I at one point I had um like a pretty severe fungal infection on my skin and I had just like splotches all over me my breasts my arms my stomach my legs just covered in these splotches and I don't like using chemical stuff you know that's just not my jam yeah so um I think I did like three or four combo ceremonies and by the second one it was already starting to clear and by the time I got back home from that retreat it went away and it just never came back that's amazing and it's it's used there's there's such a long list of you know physical conditions that combo helps with it's I mean it's been used to cure cancer like it's it's really really a miraculous medicine um so well worth in my opinion the temporary discomfort yes 
Um, so that's combo. Okay. Uh, rape or rape. Um, this is a tobacco based herbal snuff. Okay. That's used by a lot of indigenous tribes in the Amazon. Mm-hmm. So it's like a very fine powder. Um, almost always made with tobacco as the base. Tobacco okay. is a very sacred plant in many indigenous cultures. So it's yeah. really only here in like Western societies that tobacco has been um, abused and kind of stripped of its medicinal power and spirit. Yeah. So yeah, when we're using chemicals and shit to like get people addicted and yeah. cigarettes, like we're not really connecting with the spirit of tobacco, but tobacco has a beautiful, beautiful masculine spirit. Yeah. Um, and so uh, rape contains the spirit of tobacco as well as the spirit of the other plants that it's made with. Mm. Um, so there's many, many different types of blends um, okay. made by different tribes in the Amazon. And you can either self-administer it through, um, it's like a V-shaped pipe that you put in your nose and blow. Okay. Um, it's called a curipe. Or you can have it administered to you through a pipe called a tepi. Okay. So that's a long pipe with like a kind of stick on the end. Okay. And it's always received through the breath. So it's it's a medicine that you either blow into your own nose or have blown into your nose by another person. Mm-hmm. And I think that in and of itself, that aspect of it being carried through the breath or through through wind as an element is mm-hmm. so powerful because you you're carrying it with intention, with prayer. Um, if you're receiving it from another person, you're receiving the energy of that person as well. If that's a person that has dieted um, with plants, you're yeah. receiving the energy of those plants that they've dieted. Mm-hmm. So it's very intimate and very beautiful. And, and rape, it's, it's a very grounding and cleansing medicine. Okay. So if I had to, I mean, the, oh, the first time, and it's so funny my friends tell me all the time, like your first experience with rape is unlike anybody else's what first was experience. It? Mine was it was so beautiful. Oh, it was so. And it's usually not. It's intense. Okay. And I uh, often when I serve people rape for the first time, like I'm like, ooh, yeah, okay, I see what they're talking <laughs> Good about luck, now, because yeah. yeah, it's it's quite intense. I think sometimes. Um, just the sensation of having a powder blown into your nose yes. is a lot in and of itself. Um, and yeah, I remember that first time um, it was right before uh, my first combo ceremony. It's often served um, before receiving other medicines. OK. Um, so before that first combo ceremony, and I was the last person in the circle to receive. So I'm like watching everybody else get served. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, no. And everybody's like coughing really hard and like uh, looks super uncomfortable. Uh, and so I'm kind of like, OK, well, what's this going to be like? But also like going in with an open mind, like not trying to internalize anybody else's experience. And as soon as that medicine was blown into my first nostril, I just felt like the deepest sense of love, like oh. pure love. And like I was I was nervous. I was really nervous before receiving combo. Yeah. Um, and all of the nerves, all of the fear just melted away. I felt more grounded in my body than I think I've like ever felt in my entire life. And it was just really, really beautiful and I loved it so much um and I think I mean not that I've ever you know gone about trying to validate this but I'm I'm sure that I've had lifetimes where I've worked with these medicines and so I think in some way maybe um there was a bit of like a remembrance of of a a familiar friend a familiar medicine Mm -hmm. a familiar ally um that first time receiving for me Um, and yeah, I mean, I've also had many times, especially when my, my teachers, the shamans serve me, it's a very different experience. Uh Uh-huh, I'm Um, sure. Yeah, because their, their energy is so different, you know, and so it will be a different experience every time, um, depending on the person who serves it to you. Sometimes it might be, you know, a very light feminine spirit. And so it it will be a more, and, and, uh, rap is a masculine medicine. Okay tobacco as well because it's based in tobacco masculine spirited medicine but 
there are some rapes that are prepared by women, like tribes that um, are are like matriarchal. Um, so those often carry a more feminine spirit or it might be made with roses, which have a feminine spirit. So it kind of balances out the masculine or it might be served to you by somebody who's very in their feminine versus like if I, my, my teacher, um, my maestro Francisco, he, when he serves it to me, I'm, I'm like, this is not like a 10 minute experience. Like I'm like throwing up and purging for like 30 minutes. Oh I my still, gosh. I'm like, still like, where am I and what happened to me? Oh my um, gosh. But it is a beautiful, beautiful medicine. It's not hallucinogenic. Okay. Um, and like I said, very cleansing and grounding. Okay. It, um, that's, that's traditionally why it's used before other ceremonies as well, because it just kind of purifies and, uh, clears the energetic channels. It's often if, you know, if you're in an ayahuasca ceremony and you're like struggling with something, like you sense that there's like something blocked that needs to come out. If you receive rape, it will clear the block and you'll just like instantly like purge out whatever it is that needed to come out. Wow. It's incredible. Okay. So let's move to ayahuasca yeah. then. Yeah. I've, I've heard of grandmother ayahuasca. So I'm yeah. guessing a feminine, although yes. very intense experience. I haven't experienced it yet, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, Grandmother ayahuasca, yes, a feminine spirit, feminine medicine. Um, intense in many ways, but it's a, it's a longer journey. So remember how I said with Bufo, it's like a quick blast off. Yeah. With ayahuasca, it's, it's a bit of a slower journey. So you're drinking the medicine and you might be um, sitting in just complete silence and darkness for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, wow. an hour. I don't know. Time, time moves weird in ceremony. Yeah. Um, before you start to feel the effect of the medicine and first kind of, she, she moves through the body and does like a little bit of a scan of the body. Um, and then, yeah, typically for some people, it starts like with purging right away. Like they mm-hmm. start throwing up. Some people might go through an entire ceremony without purging. Wow. Um, at least through vomit. Like there's, you know, there's many ways that we purge through crying, through sound, yeah. um, through movement, somatic release. Um, and then, yeah, but I think sometimes people have a perception of like, in an ayahuasca ceremony you're just like throwing up in a bucket for like Mm -hmm. six hours yeah that's not what it's like at all Uh um it can be but not always and then the world of ayahuasca begins to open up and Mm. you'll start to have visions um depending on like sometimes you can have the experience where like the visions are happening internally in the third eye, but you may open your eyes and see like normal reality. And then other times eyes open or closed, like you're, you're in you're a different in realm. Um, and it's really beautiful. Like sometimes people see different animals. And I've been told by the shamans that when, when you're seeing animals, um, you know, especially certain animals, they talk about, This is ayahuasca, like, showing you her world and her friends. Mm. Um, And I just think that's so lovely. And, yeah, sometimes people have an experience of feeling like the medicine is doing some type of surgery on them. Like, maybe there's a specific area in the body that, like, needs some work done. And so you might feel some energy moving in that part and then suddenly, like, vomit. And, um, you know, that's the energy being moved out. And yeah, like I said, it can certainly be an intense experience and, and every ceremony is different yeah. and every person's experience is different in a ceremony. Like there could be uh, one person who just like kind of saw like rainbows and sunshine and like really beautiful things the whole time, although that's not really, yeah, <laughs> that one's never been my experience. Right. And you could have somebody that's like, I was in like the depths of hell for, I've heard that. Yeah. That's a common one. I think a yeah. lot of people have the experience of like being in what they describe as hell yeah um I've probably gone there a few times yes ayahuasca ceremonies yeah <laughs> like had, I'm quite comfortable there <laughs> yeah I wouldn't say I'm comfortable but I'm like well this is kind of what I signed up for yeah um and yeah it's it's a profoundly healing wise intelligent medicine and I think with all of these medicines the same could be said and there's many other medicines aside from these ones that I've worked with and that I've mentioned. Um, and 
they're they're all quite different each one is very unique and i think it's very important for people to kind of sense where they feel called if they feel called and like i said to trust these medicines find us we don't have to go looking for them if we are truly ready they will show up in kind of miraculous ways sometimes Mm -hmm. um my, my biggest recommendation, not that you're asking, but mm. I, I feel it's so important to say my biggest recommendation to anyone ever who's wanting to work with any plant medicine, and especially these um, indigenous plant medicines, sit with indigenous shamans. Mm. Um, I know that that doesn't always feel accessible. Yeah. And I know that it's it can perhaps be more money or more work and you know, you might have to travel, um, but sit with indigenous shamans, sit with people who have these medicines in their blood, in their lineage, in their ancestry, who have worked with the medicines enough to truly know how to keep you safe and how to keep you grounded. Because especially, I mean, with ayahuasca, I I can't emphasize this enough, you are opening yourself up to so many other dimensions and yeah. realms and it's it's not all fun and games and it's not all love and light yeah i've seen a lot of darkness and i've i've had experiences that had i not been with the shamans that i was with i could have potentially been like really really traumatized and be be one of those people that's like oh she went to an ayahuasca ceremony once and she's just never been the same since yeah um so to to be with people from a safety standpoint to Mm -hmm. be with people who are really experienced and then also from a standpoint of like if you want to meet this medicine meet meet her meet her in her language meet Mm -hmm. her in an environment that she would naturally grow in Mm -hmm. meet her um with her friends you know the people who have communed with her for so many years uh and for so many generations you know hear the traditional songs the ikaros that are sung during ceremony like I, I can't imagine a ceremony without them, but I know that there are many people um, who are leading ayahuasca ceremonies and that that aspect is not even included. And I'm like, yeah. it's so hard to understand because I'm like, but how? This is how we guide the medicine. This is yeah. how we connect with her. And so, yeah, I think if you want to have the experience, it's absolutely worth waiting till you can have it in the right way not Mm -hmm. just for your safety but to really have the fullest richest experience that you can have with the medicine it's so important that's a great tidbit and I also love that you've mentioned like she will appear she will call to you when it's time yeah so I think that was a beautiful wrap-up I know we could have talked about that for so much longer maybe we'll do a round two in the future yeah but I want to wrap up here with some of our rapid fire questions Mm, so I ask four rapid fire questions at the end of every interview okay the first one is personalized for the guests and then the last three stay the same okay so the first one for you is other than many lives many masters what is your favorite spiritual book Ooh, favorite spiritual book wow or not spiritual if that's what's calling to you well my favorite book actually you know what i i do think that this is a spiritual book okay it's technically not but it's absolutely very spiritual the little prince i have not read it but i saw that in your children's theater that's your favorite your yeah book. yeah I have a I have a tattoo actually I have two tattoos from the little prince um wow but that book I read it for the first time when I was like 13 or 14 and truth be told I read it because like I needed to like get some credits in honors English mm-hmm. and it was rated really high and it was a really short read so I was like <laughs> all right this seems like my best bet to like bump my grade up right yeah. now um and I read it and I was just in absolute tears by the end of it and it completely changed my life and I I, I do think it's actually a deeply spiritual book it's classified as a children's book but it is a 
deeply, deeply spiritual book, a beautiful story about life. And yeah, I highly recommend it if you haven't okay. read it. I'll add that to the list yeah. for sure. Question number two yeah. is what is your favorite spiritual or health practice that you would recommend for everyone? Ooh, get outside. <laughs> oh, good get, one. Get outside and connect with nature. I, at this point in my life, I'm all about keeping it simple. Yeah. And I think sometimes when it comes to a spiritual practice, like we're doing too much and we just got to do less and connect with nature in whatever way is available to you, whether that's having plants in your house uh, you know, meditating with a random tree or hugging a random tree on the sidewalk. Yes. Big, big proponent of hugging trees. Yes. Um, or, you know, getting out and hiking. Like we're lucky we live in the Bay Area. And yeah. There's beautiful hiking everywhere, but connect with nature in whatever capacity is available to you. Beautiful. Okay. Question number three, what does the world need most right now for global healing and up-leveling? Ooh, <sighs> so funny. I was going to say love. But mm. that's like that's the cheesy answer. And and what's more true and what's coming through a little bit more strongly is for people to release the need to be right. Ooh, that's a tough one. I know. That's a good one. I know. <laughs> but I think about this often and like I think so much of the suffering of the world comes from like everybody thinks that they're doing the right thing. And I think we got to care a little bit less about being right and care a little bit more about listening and hearing other people's experiences and being kind to each other. Gorgeous. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> mm. Last question. What is your one wish or ask for everyone listening today? Ooh, do something nice for yourself. <sighs> like something, something really kind. And I think... I think the kind thing looks really different depending on the day and depending on the season of the life. Like that could be giving yourself a hug or taking a bath. That could be paying off a bill or like dealing <laughs> with a debt that you've been putting off. Like feel into what is what is like a kind, a really kind thing that I can do for myself right now that's accessible and feasible and do that thing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Hmm. Thank you yeah. for coming on the show. I honestly didn't expect to dive to the deepest, darkest <laughs> depths and then hit other realms and planes. Mm. It was beautiful. Aww. So thank you so much. And if anyone listening wants to work with you or find out more about you, where can they find you? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll turn to the camera for this <laughs> one. Um, so yeah, if you're wanting to work with me or connect with me, you can find me at my website, weatherandtide.com and on Instagram. My Instagram handle is is in the process of changing okay. but it hasn't changed yet so it's currently samira in wonderland with periods in between but that's why it's changing i'm like okay it feels clunky it feels a little like an old version of me so it's time I for an that. update um, but maybe you can like link it as well in the absolutely show notes. you got it well Thank you again. This yeah, was beautiful. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. It was so fun. And for everyone listening, we will see you again next week. Bye. Hey, my friends. Thanks for joining Samira and I for a whirlwind of a conversation where we journeyed deep into the journey of the soul and plant medicines that might sound a little crazy to you or might sound a little alluring to you. No matter which side of that coin you lay on, thank you for being here. Thank you for going on this journey with us and being open-minded and open-hearted about this entire human experience. We need more people like you. If you enjoyed today's episode, please, please share it with a family member or friend. It really helps to spread the podcast. Word of mouth is essentially the best way to spread the the messages that I want to spread in the world, the messages of love, light, and goodness. So please be part of that with me and help to spread all that love and light and magic in the world. I already cannot wait to see you again next week. And until then, <laughs> bye for now, my friends. Bye.